Okay, so it's it's my pleasure today to to welcome you at the second lecture in a in an online lecture series, the elusive shape of the Platonic tradition. Uh, and today our guest and, and speaker is uh, Professor John Berbeke of the University of Toronto. Uh, last time the the inaugural lecture was given by by Professor Kevin. Corrigan, who spoke on, on Plotinus and other Platonist thinkers in comparison with Taoism uh, and, and the Eastern uh, mysticism and philosophy in general. So uh, it's, and then today we'll have John Verveke, who is also very much interested in, in ancient wisdom, ancient spiritual practice, but from a, from a different angle. Uh, John Verveke is a professor uh, at the University of Toronto. As I said, he's a philosopher and, and psychologist working primarily within cognitive science. And I must uh, make a, a, a sort of a confession that, I, I mean, I, having studied psychology, uh, I was, and philosophy as well, I was very skeptical towards uh, academic psychology, and towards cognitive psychology and cognitive science. So I had to overcome some bias. Uh, but when I was listening to John's uh, lectures and conversations, and when, when I talked to him, the, I, I managed to overcome these biases because I, I, I assumed that there is simply no way to combine fruitfully current academic uh, psychology and cognitive science, which I perceived as as fragmented and uh, unable to to provide a sort of a holistic view of things. So, but listening to John, as I said, is is a is a marvelous experience. Among other reasons for it is that that he is trying to show a, a very different view of of uh, these these disciplines, and they work very well with with the history of philosophy and, and philosophy as as we will see today uh, i'm sure so uh, i'm very pleased that that we can today in this series hear john's thoughts on on neoplatonism and cognitive science because i know john that, that the neoplatonic tradition is is important to you and uh, and i'm very curious uh, about both the lecture and the discussion afterwards. So, well, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. That's a, that's a very wonderful um, and um, kind introduction. I didn't realize you had been prejudiced against cognitive science. I've, I'm glad I've convinced you that there's at least one cognitive scientist that might have something valuable to say uh, towards Neoplatonism and ancient philosophy. Uh, there are others, and I hope to perhaps convince you of that as this goes on. Uh, I'm going to talk about Neoplatonism and cognitive science, specifically a unifying framework that is being proposed right now for cognitive science called 4E Cognitive Science, and I'll explain later what that is as the lecture unfolds. So <clears throat> at the heart, I'm not saying the core, but um, I, sorry, I'm not saying like the exhaustive comprehensive whole, but at the heart of Neoplatonism is the integ integration of two central theories. Uh, one is Aristotle's conformity theory of knowing, in which the in which for the mind to know something is for the mind and that thing to share the same form. And we all, of course, know that form doesn't mean shape; it means structural, functional organization. It means the binding through line of intelligibility. The knower and the knower both participate in that same structural, functional organization. There is an at one ment in some sense, in knowing. Um, and I think this is a pretty standard take, so I don't think that's terribly controversial uh, to say. The second is Plato's theory of spiritual ascent, um, which is the process whereby the psyche becomes more internally harmonious and beautiful, for example, and therefore uh, that, that psyche can then realize deeper beauty and harmony in the world, which helps educate the psyche so it can better achieve harmony and realize beauty within. And then that loops in this ascending or accelerating process known as anagage. Um, and I'll often refer to it as reciprocal opening for reasons that'll become uh, clear. But I'll use those terms uh, interchangeably because that is my primary understanding. 
<clears throat> both of these theories have uh, sort of been out of place. Uh, I'm trying to give the kindest, most neutral a neglect for these theories uh, since the scientific revolution, uh, because they the conformity theory of knowing uh, has been replaced with a representational theory of knowing, and I'll go more into detail what that means. And the spiritual ascent has been largely replaced by spirituality understood as the ascent to systems of belief in some fashion, uh, and which emphasize know the knowing of propositions, the, the harnessing, the marshalling of rigorous uh, propositional systems. Um, and of course, there are there are lots of resistance to this, you know. And I'm not David Schindler is here, and he's a prime example. I'm I'm just pointing to sort of the norm within academia and academic philosophy. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just stating what I think is a historical fact. What I'm going to argue, though, is that the current cognitive science, specifically for e cognitive science, is producing a framework that makes credible and reprioritizes a conformity theory of knowing and offers a new and powerful explanation of anagoge and further explains how they belong together within an integrated theoretical framework. And in doing that, I will give an argument about how 4E Cogsci could shift Neoplatonism from being something largely of historical interest within academic circles and largely neglected in the culture at large, with notable exceptions, of course. And I want to instead propose that Neoplatonism should now be taken seriously, even scientifically, and that in addition to that scientific legitimacy, it gains a kind of existential uh, possibility as advocated by Pierre Hadot, Neoplatonism is a completely possible way of life. A philosophy is a way of life in which our scientific theory can help to guide us in the cultivation, curation, and practice of spiritual exercises. Um, and I think this is a very important cultural turn that is available to us. I think the ability to rewed something that has been the backbone of many spiritual traditions, Neoplatonism, to uh, a cutting edge cognitive science will help to reintegrate science and spirituality in a way that I think will help to address the meaning crisis that is so besetting uh, Western and inherent and intrinsically, sorry, uh, and increasingly more and more global civilization. And I won't go into the meaning crisis in great detail, because if you start me talking about that, I will start talking for over 52 hours. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to proceed uh, in the following way. I will begin by examining the philosophical background of 4 e Cogsci and try to show how there's a convergence argument that raises the plausibility of the conclusion from that convergence. And then I will provide the psychological background and along the way, I'll explain why, so just hang on, I'll explain why it is called 4E Cogsci and why this 4E nature of Cogsci is relevant to our topic at hand. Okay. So 4E Cogsci begins from a rejection of the previously dominant framework that for the understanding that mind that began, began in the scientific revolution. And it begins with uh, sort of Descartes' proposal, but it is given explicit naming by Thomas Hobbes. By ratiocination, which is an older word for cognition, I mean computation. That's Hobbes. And the proposal that we could make a mechanical machine that could do computation and therefore would be a thinking being. So this model has come to fruition in, of course, the computer and AI revolution that began in the 1950s and has been going at an increasing rate and is coming to a threatening uh, point now with the advent of the large language models like ChatGPT and other things that are bringing to the fore this question about this model of the mind. So what is this Cartesian computational framework? That's how I'll call it. Um, it is the idea that although you reject substance dualism because science is committed to a kind of naturalism, nevertheless, you keep the idea that somehow, which goes a little bit hand-wavy for a long time, reality is divided into two worlds, 
the inner subjective world of the mind and the outer objective world of matter. The outer world is measured and explained by mathematical mechanics. And therefore, the mind knows this world by being a mathematical slash logical machine. It is a machine for the manipulation of mathematical and logical relations. That is exactly what a computer is. It is mathematical mechanics realized in an automated machine. It is Thomas Hobbes' dream come true, or perhaps nightmare come upon us. The mind in this model, the mind knows by internally, somehow in the head, internally manipulating propositional, because that's what you find in the code of a computer program, propositions, logical propositions, by manipulating propositional representations of the world according to the rules of predication. How can I form a subject-predicate relationship that's well-formed, like the cat is on the mat, and implication. If the cat is on the mat, that implies that the cat is not outside and things like that, okay, by the rules of predication and implication. So I I'm internally, mechanically, ultimately manipulating propositional representations according to the rules of predication and implication. And of course, this looks like how we do science. Uh, it looks like how we do math. It looks like how we do logic. And all of those go together, and it sits in a wonderful family, and, that's, and we progress and progress and progress. And that, that has sort of been the picture. And you get what Charles Taylor calls a subtract a subtraction story in which we were once beset by all this fuzzy, woolly thinking like Neoplatonism with all of its superstitions, and we have freed ourselves from that, and now we can calculate the world. Leibniz's dream of a universal calculus in which all philosophical disputes will be resolved by calculation. Okay, so that's the model, and of course, it is still a prominent model, and it was the first framework within cognitive science that was adopted in the 50s, cognitive psychology, the computational metaphor is pervasive and profound and so influential that it's virtually transpar transparent in cognitive psychology. Cognitive science has become much more reflectively critical of this framework. And part of my job, to the annoyance of many of my psychology colleagues, is to bring that reflective critique on the computational metaphor back into psychology and disrupt some of their chosen um, theories, uh, which has uh, helped to explain uh, why for a very long time I was a maverick, uh, although until now very recently, I, I'm now sort of, um, I'm now sort of, he's our maverick at the University of Toronto. So that that's how it is. All right. So how does 4E Cogside begin to reject this framework? What is the philosophical and psych what are the philosophical and psychological backgrounds that afford this and power it? 4E Cogside is deeply influenced by Heidegger. This is a really important thing to know. The, the, the influence is clear and pervasive. It comes through Van Gelder into dynamical systems theory. It comes through Dreyfus into the frame problem. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. But first of all, I want to remind people, uh, first of all, of an astonishing book. This is James Filler's amazing book. I keep promoting this book as much as I can. And he makes the very powerful argument, uh, although Heidegger never explicitly states it, although he is deeply influenced by Eckhart and deeply impressed by Zen, uh, Heidegger is actually turning back towards a Neoplatonic ontology and epistemology, although not acknowledging it. I can't take the time to make that argument. I've made it elsewhere publicly. James has made it in both papers and this. So turning to Heidegger already, even though we may not normally realize it, it's turning us towards something uh, that is oriented towards the Neoplatonic framework. So Heidegger rejects the computational framework, the Cartesian computational framework. That is the core and abiding theme of his philosophical endeavor. Um, and so what is that framework? It's the framework that truth is something like a coherence of inter an internal coherence of propositions that re represents the world well, which means it somehow corresponds to the world well. 
and that's what truth is, and that's how we do science. We get a, we get a coherent set of propositions that somehow corresponds to reality by representing reality in the correct manner. So it's an epistemology at a distance. We are always in here somehow gesturing or pointing from within to the without. And Heidegger argues, and of course, a lot of other people were arguing along the way, this is a bankrupt framework. Uh, as soon as you do this divide of subjectivity to objectivity, and you claim that it is both exhaustive and dichotomous, you have no possible relation between the subjective and the objective. None whatsoever. There is nothing in your onto-epistemology that makes a place for how the subjective can be bind, bound to the objective. And so you get the increasing history of skepticism and or solipsisms of some kind. And then Heidegger adds, you get, of course, what the phenomenological tradition, starting with Husserl, uh, pointed to, that that model is just not true to our phenomenological experience. We don't experience ourselves as radically trapped inside to a world that we are not in any kind of direct relationship with. That is not the nature of our experience. And so you get this sort of weird thing where you say, although that's our experience and the experience is the basis of our theoretical model, that theoretical model completely undermines the fundamental structure of our experience, which is a significant performative contradiction. And so, I mean, I'm summarizing a lot of Heidegger, but you get these two ideas that what you've got is that once you set up the situation this way, you are condemned to solipsism and skepticism, and you are condemned to an inauthentic, not being true to the actual phenomenological intelligibility of your experience. And that is at the core of the critique. Now, Heidegger goes on to argue that this, these failures are because that structure actually must presuppose a connection between the subjective and the objective. And he does a, what has been questioned as an etymology of aletheia, as uncovering, discovering, I don't care if the etymology is right or not. The, the proposal of truth as, as an event that grounds and binds and is more primordial than the subjective and objective brings them in a co-determining relationship uh, to each other, I think is well said. I have named this the transjective, that which is between and beyond the subjective and the objective, just to fit into that category with the same kind of term. I will avoid all the, I think, largely useless debates around whether or not aletheia is the way um, Heidegger says it is. Um, I think whether or not that's historically accurate, I think it is phenomenologically true, and I think it is conceptually needed. I think that transjective is true to our experience, and we need something that is neither objective nor subjective to bind the two together. So that is the argument, in a nutshell, that truth is subjective, and therefore meaning, insofar as it affords truth, is also transjective in nature. Truth is transjective, and meaning must be transjective. Not comprehensively, but at least crucially. The second major theme that comes from Heidegger, as I mentioned, is the work uh, that came through Herbert Dreyfus. And so D Herbert Dreyfus wrote an important book in 1972, challenging the Cartesian computational frame called What Computers Can't Do. He then revised it in the 90s and with the new title, What Computers Still Can't Do. And What Computers Still Can't Do has solved what is called the frame problem. Um, now, I agree with Shanahan and many other people see the anthologies, the robots dilemma, that at the core of the frame problem is the problem of relevance. And this is what I've dedicated most of my cognitive scientific work to. This is the problem of how do we realize, become aware of, and actualize relevance. Why is this a problem? 
the amount of information you can pay attention to in the environment and the possible combinations and patterns in that information is astronomically vast. It's greater than the number of particles in the universe. The possible combinations of all the pieces of information in your long-term long memory is greater than the number of atomic particles in the universe. The number of potential problem solutions you have that are available to you that are logically possible for any standard problem outnumbers the number of particles, atomic particles in the universe. The number of sequences of action you can perform, et cetera, et cetera. You cannot compute your way through these. It would, It is computationally intractable because the amount of information available to be checked is combinatorially explosive. And yet what you do, and you're doing it right now, out of all the things you could potentially be paying attention to, all the things you remember, all the possibilities you could be considering, all the sequences of action you can generate, you're zeroing in on the relevant information and fitting yourself well to this situation to achieve the goals you're trying to achieve right now. And this, you do not do this. You do not check all the information to see if it's relevant. You somehow ignore it. You zero in on it. And this intelligent ignorance, Ignoring is at the core of the frame problem. You, of course, have a self-organizing, please remember that, process of correcting when you have misframed a situation. And this is an insight. This is when you realize that you have misframed a situation. You say something like, I thought she was angry, but aha, it turns out she's afraid. And what you considered relevant and what relevant inferences you made were wrong, and you change what is salient and relevant to you. Insight points to the fact that relevance realization is a self-organizing and therefore a dynamical process. So what about computation and relevance? So this, I have so much published on this, and so I'm going to, and so much both in video and in you know, peer-reviewed journals. Just had one come out this month in uh, uh, in Frontiers. Uh, very proud of it. A co-author with uh, uh, Johannes Jaeger and Anna Riddell, a student of mine, Alex Javedovic, a student of mine, um, of course, myself, and then Dennis Walsh, a uh, colleague of mine at the University of Toronto. And I'll get back to that paper in a second. But to go to a point that Fodor made, and why am I choosing Fodor? Fodor is the premier philosopher of the computational theory of mind. He is Chomsky's protege. He is the premier author of it, but I give him credit for being a great critic of his own position because he has some of the deepest criticisms of the computational framework. What's his main argument? His argument is that the relations of predication and implication, which are considered necessary and sufficient for computation, cannot capture relations of relevance. There's a long argument here, but I'll give you an intuitive version of it. Let's take a proposition. Tomorrow it will be windy. Okay, is it well formed? Do I follow the rules of predication? Yes. So its predication structure is constant. How many implications does it have? Combinatorially explosive. The number of relations it has to other propositions is vast. Now that is stable. Its implication structure and its predication structure is stable, but its relevance changes. Tomorrow will be windy. That's relevant to me if I'm going skydiving. Relevant to me in a different way if I'm flying a kite. Relevant different to me if I'm going out for a picnic. Potentially not relevant to me at all if I'm staying in and watching a movie. And so on and so on and so on. So the predicate structure and the implication structures that are necessary and sufficient for computation are constant while the relevance is changing, which means the computational machinery can't capture the variance in relevance. Strong argument. I think it's a knockdown argument, by the way. What about the rule following that's at the core of computation? The program is following the rules of logic and, uh, and of the language, and et cetera. Well, this is an old argument that goes back to Brown and through Brown to Wittgenstein and through Wittgenstein to Aristotle. Yay. Um, and the argument goes like this. Well, what is it to follow a rule? Let's just take an easy moral rule, be kind. 
What's the problem with the propositional predication and all the logical inferential logical implication relations? They don't capture the conditions of application for the rule. What do I mean by that? Well, what is it for me to be kind to all of you right now? Then how is that different from, I, and think about how that's different from how I'm kind to my students and how that's different from how I'm kind to my son. Imagine if I was treating my son how I treat my students. That would be inappropriate. How about if I treat my students the way I'm kind to my romantic partner? I'm going to get into trouble. I'm going to get into serious trouble. What if I treated you the way I treat my romantic partner? That's weird and creepy, and you're probably going to leave. And then what you'll do is, well, I'll make rules for each one of those contexts. And then for each one of those contexts, I need rules of application. And then what you get is a combinatorially explosive infinite regress of rules. And it has to terminate in something that's not a rule, not a proposition, not a knowing that, but a knowing how to apply a rule appropriately in a situation. And that is not a computational function. What about representation? I've called this the representational framework. John Searle argued very well in the rediscovery of the mind in 1992 that every representation is aspectual. Water bottle. Out of all of its properties, all the true predicates of this, and how many of those are there, combinatorially explosive, I select some very small subset and how they're relevant to each other and how they're relevant to the goal. If I represent this as a weapon, I'm picking up on other features and putting them together in ways that are relevant to me. Every representation is aspectual and aspectuality presupposes, requires, demands relevance realization. Therefore, relevance realization precedes in its primordial two representation. So notice that relevance realization is before computation. It's before representation. It's before rule following. I've made similar arguments, how it's presupposed by memory, how it's presupposed by categorization, how it's presupposed by problem solving. Relevance realization is as, as at the core of cognition and relevance realization is not computational. In fact, that's the point of the most recent paper. Naturalizing relevance realization, why relevance realization is not computational, because the argument is the act of forming a formal system, and all computational systems are formal systems, the act of formalization is itself an ill-defined problem that presupposes relevance realization. You can't make an a priori formal system for making all of your formal systems. Computation doesn't capture relevance realization. The third thing I mentioned, and I'll only indicate it because I'll explain it better uh, when I come back uh, to the psycho psychological, is through Van Gelder and others, and a little bit with Dreyfus and others, uh, Evan Thompson and others, is that uh, Heidegger has influenced the emergence of dynamical systems. And I'll explain how, what, how dynamical systems are not formal, are other than formal systems. And we'll get back to that in a few minutes. So Heidegger's influence is huge. Now, here's the point I want to make. This primordial relevance realization is transjective in nature. Is the relevance of this in the object? No. It's relevant one minute to me, not relevant another. It may be relevant to me, it's not relevant to you. Is the relevance arbitrary and subjective by me? No, because then I couldn't be mistaken about what's relevant. And I clearly am many times mistaken by what is relevant what I consider relevant. And that's what insight shows me. I went, oh, I thought that mattered. It turns out that doesn't matter. This is what matters. Because relevance realization is about problem solving. Problems are not properties of objects. Objects just are. They're not just our subjective world because you have to change the world in order to solve your problems. Problems are transjective. They're about refitting yourself to the world so you achieve your goals. Relevance is transjective. Problem solving is transjective. 
Therefore, cognition is ultimately transjective in nature. So truth and relevance, and now therefore even more strongly and meaning are transjective in nature. Science presupposes truth, relevance, and meaning. And then you get the wonderful argument by Adam Frank, Marcello Gleiser, and Evan Thompson in The Blind Spot that when you understand that science presupposes things like relevance, realization, and meaning, and this transjectivity, uh, you can't carry out science to conclude that the phenomenological world that is the grounding of all of that is somehow an illusion because then you're into the performative contradiction of saying this illusory thing, which is the grounding basis for my truth and meaning and relevance, right, is somehow giving me true knowledge, which, of course, is a performative contradiction. I recommend the book to you. It's well written and it's very accessible. So that's the continental tradition. What about the analytic tradition? The analytic tradition, of course, is inherently computational. To do philosophy is to basically do computation with propositions, analyzing their predicate structure, tracing out their implication relations, et cetera. So here I point to uh, Pickard's, I'm sorry, Pickstock's astonishing book, Aspects of Truth Towards a New Religious Metaphysics, uh, astonishing book. We're living in a time of great books, which is really wonderful. I can't summarize all that book. I'll just summarize one key move she makes in it, is that all the great distinctions that supported the computational representational framework, the idea of knowledge at a distance through computation, have collapsed under analytic argumentation. So within the analytic tradition, we have arguments that have, for example, undermine the analytic synthetic distinction. That's the famous and largely consensus approved argument by Quine, undermining the analytic synthetic distinction. We have the theory data distinction, much beloved by positivist and empiricists that has been undermined by the Duham Quine thesis, showing no, that theory and data completely interpenetrate and co-determine each other. And this again is largely has a consensus status within the philosophy of science. Um, now, one that doesn't have consensus status but is taken very seriously is the collapsing of the fact-value distinction. Putnam has done a lot of work on that. I point to you that relevance sits right at the collapse between the fact-value distinction because of its transjective nature. Is relevance a fact? Well, that's how facts are relevant to us. It, 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 is it just a value? No, because it has to pertain to the facts in the right way or it can't solve my problem. And then... Recently, Casebeer and others have argued that Hume's is-ought distinction collapses. The is-ought argument, Hume's argument ultimately depends on Moore's analytic argument, the naturalistic, so-called naturalistic fallacy. Um, Casebeer shows, I think, pretty clear that the is-ought distinction, uh, sorry, Hume, so, sorry, Moore's uh, naturalistic argument, non-naturalistic argument depends repeatedly on the analytic synthetic distinction. He invokes it repeatedly. And if the analytic synthetic distinction has collapsed, then Moore's argument collapses, and then Hume's is-ought distinction collapses. Now, collapse doesn't mean there's no difference between them, but it means that they are interpenetrating and interdefining. What that means is they touch each other. They are interpenetrating and interdefining. And Pickstock therefore says, hey, look, all of the distinctions that support the representational account of knowledge has collapsed, and we're now back to, and she explicitly argues for it, a conformity theory of knowing. So notice what we've got, and she makes this point. Both the continental tradition and the Anglo-American analytic tradition have converged independently which significantly raises the plausibility of the conclusion, they have converged independently on the conclusion that the framework, the Cartesian computational framework, is in some sense fundamentally bankrupt. And we are returning, therefore, to a conformity theory. What about the psychological background? So I was, I had the great privilege of studying with 
John M. Kennedy at the University of Toronto. Yes, all knowledge begins at the University of Toronto. Um, I had the great privilege of studying with him, and he was the protege, uh, probably the most important follower of J.J. Gibson, who was a revolutionary in the psychology of perception. And that revolution is now coming to be more and more appreciated. What Gibson argued is that perception is not primarily or initially about objects. It is about affordances from which we later abstract objects and actors. What is an affordance? The water bottle is graspable. It affords grasping. Is graspability a property of the water bottle? No, it's not graspable by a fly. Is it a property of my hand? No, I cannot grasp the circumference of the earth. Affordances are transjective real relation of good fittedness between the actor and the object, between the agent and the arena. They are transjective through and through. And all of there's increasing empirical evidence that that is what perception works in terms of. This is the grounding thing that perception makes use of. Now, this is backed by, right, overlaps. The psychology overlaps with a revolution happening in biology um, where people are challenge challenging what's called the modern synthesis. One of the people doing that at the University of Toronto is my colleague, Dennis Walsh, who was on that paper with me that I mentioned a few minutes ago. One of the things that is challenging that is that the old model had a model in which the environment puts selective pressure on organisms that are modified through reproduction. The new model is, yes, but organisms individually and collectively shape their environment by their interactions with it. So organisms are shaping the environment as the environments are shaping the organism. We have what's called niche construction, which is this dynamic loop. It is a self-organizing system that binds the organism and the environment together in a mutually participating, mutually shaping manner that makes the primary thing, the primary engine of evolution exist, which is adaptivity. Adaptivity is not in the organism. The great white shark won't survive if you drop it in the ocean. Adaptivity is not in the environment. What is hostile to me is a thriving environment for certain kinds of bacteria. Adaptivity is a relation of real fittedness, mutual participation, co-shaping, co-belonging in a shared dynamical system. It is at an at oneing between the environment and the organism in a profound way. Here's the proposal that I've argued for at length, and I'll only give it the proposal that biology adaptivity is our biological dynamically fittedness to the environment. Cognition relevance realization is our cognitive dynamical fittedness to the environment. They are species of the same genus of dynamically organized fittedness, evolving fittedness to the environment, which is a co-participating, co-shaping at one mint between the organism and the environment, the agent and the arena, the subject and the object. This helps to explain things like the Baldwin effect. The Baldwin effect is something like at some point our ancestors invented and learned, they had to learn language, but language became a pervasive feature of the environment. And then it put selective pressure on people so that they evolved to get stronger and stronger in innate mechanisms, Chomsky and mechanisms for language. Niche construction explains how something as weird as language could have evolved innate features in us. How did it come, how did the environment come to have language in it such that it could put selective pressure on us so we have innate biological mechanisms? You need niche construction, and therefore you need all of the machinery I've just talked about. 
And what I'm trying to propose to you is that dynamical systems give us a new and powerful way of understanding structural, functional organization, of understanding form and formal cause. And many people are explicitly arguing this, like Alicia Urero in her amazing books, Dynamic in Action and Context Changes Everything. So dynamical systems are these inherently self-organizing, self-regulating systems that bind elements together in this flowing, evolving fashion. Now, in psychology, these, this notion of dynamical system is increasingly coming in to replace the formal systems of computational models where computation is done in the head. In the new model, cognition is between you and the world. A good example of that is the psychology of emotion. My friend and colleague, also at one time at the University of Toronto, uh, Mark Lewis, was famous for bringing dynamical systems theory in to explain the neuroscience of emotion. In connection with that, I'm going to bring in a more specific theory he has. He is also considered one of the world's experts, for good reason, on the psychology of addiction. He and many other people are overturning the chemical dependency model. Now, nobody, nobody's denying that chemical factors are at work in addiction, but the chemical dependency model doesn't explain a lot of the data. One example of many, you have soldiers in Vietnam using heroin, an opiate, and opiates are so addictive, they return to the United States and the overwhelming, like over 90% of them spontaneously stop using the heroin. But where's the chemical dependency? What's going on is they have a different identity in a different cultural setting. Okay, so remember, they're in a different age of agent arena relationship. So what might addiction be? So let's take a different model. Let's take a learning model. The world is very overwhelming to me, complex. So I drink some alcohol to alleviate the anxiety. As I drink the alcohol, I become cognitively impaired. So my ability to solve problems diminishes. Not only when I'm drunk, by the way, it diminishes. That means my ability to solve problems goes down. So the world now becomes, I lose possibilities. I lose options. I lose flexibility in the world. And the world becomes narrower. And then that becomes more threatening. And so I take more alcohol, right? And now my cognition becomes narrow. And then the world becomes narrower. And so he has a proposal that addiction is reciprocal narrowing until the agent has lost all flexibility and there is no options in the arena, and that is the compulsion of addiction, reciprocal narrowing. Powerful theory, gaining a lot of traction. So I'm at lunch with Mark, and I said, I really like the, the reciprocal narrowing thing that we're talking about, and he's very happy because it's one academic praising another and all that sort of thing. And I said, but Mark, if there's reciprocal narrowing, surely there has to be reciprocal opening. And he went, Oh my God, you're right. There has to be. It's the same machinery. That's the, that there has to be reciprocal opening. And I said, yeah, there would be, I gain some flexibility. The world opens up. I see different patterns. I then can learn that transforms my skills and I can reciprocally open to the world. And he went, oh, that's right. And then I looked around and you get a model of reciprocal opening in the psychology of love. Now, love is not an emotion. Love is an existential mode. It is a binding of agent and a arena, arena together. Love is not an emotion. Why? Because I love my partner. She's away right now at a yoga retreat. So I'm sad. The love makes me sad. Sometimes the love makes me happy. Sometimes it makes me angry. Hey, don't you threaten my partner. Sometimes it makes me envious or jealous. You know, I wish I was with Sarah more. Or I wish I had that relationship with Sarah. And, you know, that can be vicious. I'm not, I'm not saying that's all good, but I'm trying to explain to you that both positive and negative emotions are generated by love. Love is an existential stance. It's a binding of the agent and the arena together. Now take a look at the work of Aaron. That's the person's last name, not first name. How do you fall in love with somebody? And not just romantic love, friendship love. You do what is called mutually accelerating disclosure. Psychologists have a knack for turning something like love into something that sounds very boring and technical. Mutually accelerating disclosure. What, how does that work? So let's say I'm talking uh, to David. And what I do is 
I become vulnerable. I, 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 you know, I expose something of my inner self, something I normally keep protected in secret to him. And he reciprocates, notice the language, reciprocation, by doing the same. And he opens up to me. And then I open up more to him. And then he op and because I've opened up, he gets a better sense of what he can say to me and a better sense of what's going on inside. And then because he opens up to me, I have more insight into him. And we, we do this resonance of mind sight, and we reciprocally open to each other. Love is knowing. It's a kind of knowing. It's a reciprocally opening kind of knowing. There is knowing by loving. There is knowing by participating, co-participating in a dynamical system of at one between you and another person. This is anagoge. This is what it is. It's a reciprocal opening, a knowing by loving, in which people are growing and growing deeper, not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. I've got about six or seven more minutes. Is that okay, Matthias? So notice we've already got what we need. We've got a, we've got a return of the conformity theory. We've got a return of anagage. I want to show you how this shows up in some important ways. So this is work I do drawn from 4E Cognitive Science. And now I'm going to explain to you what 4E Cognitive Science is, because I have what I need to explain it to you. It's the proposal of four E's for cognitive science. I think there's two more E's, but the standard is four. The first is embodiment. Your body is not a Cartesian vessel that you happen to move around. Whether or not Descartes actually thought that is beside the point. Okay. <clears throat> Look, relevance realization. What is relevance realization? And notice the word I'm going to use and notice how much it fits with what I just said about knowing by loving. Relevance realization is when I care about some information and don't care about other information. It's caring. It's caring connectedness. It's caring bindingness. Computers don't care about the information they're processing. That's why they can't do relevance realization. Now, why do you care? And why do computers not care? You care because you are constantly taking care of yourself. You are not just a dynamical system. You are an autopoietic system. You are a dynamical system that dynamically organizes to seek out and therefore care about those things that matter to you literally matter to you like food and matter to you like an information because you are constantly making yourself by the way you are coupled to the environment. You are constantly taking care of yourself and therefore you care about this information and don't care about that information. The paramecium is not a machine. It's an agent because it cares about a certain molecule as food. It aspectualizes a sucrose molecule as food. There's no such thing as food in physics. And it aspectualizes this molecule as poison. There's no such thing as poison in the physics. But you care. You care. And what does it mean to be an autopoetic thing? What is it? What's the term we have for that autopoetic system? It's your body. That's what a body is. A body is an autopoetic system, a self-making, self-caring, dynamical system. You have to have a body to do relevance realization, to be cognitive. Okay, second E, embedded. Cognition is not in the head, it's between you and the world. Relevance realization, transjective, affordances are transjective, adaptivity is transjective. Cognition is embedded. It's not in you, it's between you and the world. Enacted. Cognition is not computation in the head, it is that loop, that interactive loop with the environment, like in niche construction. You enact your cognition. You do not compute it in your head. It is extended. So embodied, embedded, 30 is enacted, 40 is extended. You are cognitive by participating in dynamical systems that extend into the environment with objects, with situations, with other people. I think we should add in a 50. Cognition is inherently emotional but read it really broadly to mean like existential moding, like love and care. And ex, uh, cognition is also exaptive. Cognition takes sensory motor processes and lists them up. 
for cognitive processes. How are we doing that? I just did it. Cognition, look what I did with my hands. I did a sensory motor thing, and I used this metaphor of lifting up to talk about processes of abstraction. And what we do is we take that sen those sensory motor capacities that we use to navigate and narrate and negotiate physical space, and we exact them up in order to navigate, narrate, and negotiate conceptual space. And this means we have multiple kinds of knowing, which is kind of the core of my work in some ways. I'll just go through them. And this is a, a, a typology, and typologies are... You argue for them by showing their systematicity, and I'm going to do that. So you have propositional knowing. This is the knowing. This is what the computational framework reduced all knowing to. No, knowing is propositional knowing. It's knowing that. It corresponds roughly or maybe better approximately to the Greek notion of dianoia, discursive reasoning, right? It, it is carried out with propositions. You have a, a kind of memory for this called semantic memory. This is distinguishable from other kinds of memory. This is where you store propositions like cats are mammals. Um, it gives you beliefs. You believe that cats are mammals and you can coordinate those beliefs to give you theory theories. And it gives you a sense, a normative sense. That normative sense is a conviction or a conclusion of truth. And so argumentation is how you bring about that sense. Okay. And I'm not denying this, this exists. Of course it exists. There are some four ECOG sized people that try to deny it exists. I think this just puts them into a horror. What's your theory then? What's your theory? Like it gets you into a performative contradiction. So I think denying that this exists, uh, no, I don't agree with that. But where I agree with a lot of my colleagues is this is not the exclusive or most important kind of knowing. Because as I already showed you, Knowing that, propositional knowing, is dependent on knowing how, knowing how to apply a rule. This is procedural knowing, knowing how. And it doesn't use propositions, it uses procedures, it, use, it uses forms of interaction. And it's stored in procedural memory. You remember how to catch a ball, how to swim, and you can remember that know-how even though you know, lose all the semantic knowledge about swimming and football. What's football? I don't know. That's a kind of amnesia but I throw the ball at you and you catch it. That happens. Okay. It doesn't result in beliefs. It results in skills and skills aren't true or false. They are powerful or not. They apply or not. They have conditions of application. They are powerful or not. Now, how applying your skills, what do I need to apply my skills? I need a situational awareness. I need to know what it is like being me in this situation. I need to know what it is like to be me in this situation. This is perspectival knowing. And procedural knowing is probably approximate to the Greek word techne. I'm going to propose, and I have Matt Mateson and others to argue, that perspectival knowing is very close to the Greek noesis. Noticing. This is knowing by noticing, by sizing up, by situating yourself appropriately. It has a, a, its own kind of memory, episodic memory. Unlike your knowledge of cats, when I ask you, can you remember what you had for breakfast? You go back into a perspective and you relive it. And you have this different kind of memory because it solves problems that procedural and propositional knowing can't solve. That's why you have it. Now, there's an argument that's probably why consciousness existed so that we could have episodic memory so that we could solve the problems that are only solvable with episodic memory. What does episodic memory give you? It doesn't give you beliefs or skills. It gives you perspectives, hence the name. And its sense of truth, no, that's the wrong word. Its sense of realness is the sense of presence. I'm in the situation. I'm in it. I'm really in it. Video gamers are after this. They want people who have a sense of presence, that they're in the game, that they're in the game. That's your sense of presence. But how could I be in? How can I be in a situation? It's not the same. It's not enough to be spatiotemporally in a physical location. 
I have to belong to it. It has to belong to me. I have to have niche construction going on. I have to have that bindedness. This is participatory knowing. This is by knowing by participation. This is knowing by knowing with that I've already been describing to you. This is knowing through agent arena coupling, the generation not of beliefs or skills of perspective, but of affordances. And it doesn't give you semantic memory or procedural memory or episodic memory. It gives you this very weird kind of memory we call the self. Its sense of realness is not the conclusion of truth, the sense of power, the sense of presence. It's the sense of belonging, the sense of belonging. And you have, you sense that lost when you feel homesick or you're in the middle of culture shock or you walk into a situation and you know you don't belong there because of who and what you are. I think this also goes into meaning in life, but that's another piece of my work and I won't get into that. So Dan Chiappi and I published a bunch of papers recently about a situation that really tests for ECOGSI. This is the scientists, the literal scientists, the NASA scientists on Earth moving the rovers around on Mars like Odyssey and Spirit. So how could that possibly be about enacted, embedded, extent, like... There's time delay, there, right? There's you can't joystick. There's right. There's too much time delay. So how could so Hori Cogsite can't possibly be at work there, right? 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 Wrong. 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 Because here's what they do: before they let people do any of the moving the rover around, so that they can gain the data to create the propositional theory, they look for. So before they can do the theory, they need somebody who has the skills. And before they look for somebody to get the skills, they look for somebody who can do this perspectival participatory thing. They can be on Mars as the rover. They get a sense, I'm the rover on Mars. How do they do this? They do it imaginally. And here I'm invoking Corbin's sense of the imaginal, right? They do it imaginatively and narratively. They do things like this. They, first of all, they indwell. I'm using Polanyi's terms here. They indwell the rover. They identify. Listen to my language. They identify with the rover. I need to go there or we need to go there. Not the rover needs to go there. I need to go there. I need to move my arm, meaning the rover needs to move one of its things. So they indwell the rover imaginally. And then they internalize the rover. They do things like this. This is one of the scientists. This literally happened. Okay, 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 okay. She's sitting on a wheelchair. Here's a rock. She puts her phone down. I need to do this. I need to do this. And she swivels around and she does this perspectival participation in what it's like to be the rover in a fully enacted, embedded way so that she can solve the problem of how the rover needs to move. And what are they creating? They're creating an imaginable narrative loop between them and the rover. And what that allows them to do is get us, they can look at flat black and white pictures and they'll color it. They'll actually distort it with colored markers. They make it less veridical because they can then tap into this looping and then they can suddenly, I'm on the Mar I'm on Mars with, I'm the rover on Mars. And they can get the topography from these delayed distorted because they're just two-dimensional pictures. They get the participatory and perspectival knowing that the researchers are looking for. And once they get that, then they can cultivate the skills of how to move the rover around to get the evidence so that they can form the propositional theory. The case study, which should be really difficult, actually is strong evidence for the dependency of propositional knowing on procedural knowing, which is dependent on perspectival, which is dependent on participatory. These scientists will say really weird things. And you can think of theurgia here. They'll say, you know, I was in the garden and I was gardening and my left wrist kept getting stuck. And I came to the lab and Spirit, that's the name of one of the rovers, right? And Spirit's left front wheel kept getting stuck. I mean, 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there's any magic, but there seems to be some kind of sympathetic connection. And these are hard bitten NASA scientists saying this. Okay, so all of this is non propositional knowing, it's non computational, it is conformity, it is anagogic, it is looping, it is everything I have been arguing for. We have non-propositional knowing, a kind of knowing by loving, a knowing by caring. They love and identify the, the, the rover. They are really concerned if the rover might die. That's how they refer to it, running out of power. They're emotionally involved. We have non-propositional knowing by loving that is about a coupling, a looping, a participating in the same dynamical system, a radical at one -ing. A radical conformity. This looping can afford the enhancement of relevance realization through reciprocal opening, knowing by loving, knowing by identifying, knowing by caring, anagoge. Therefore, at the core of the Neoplatonic theory, we have a conformity theory that affords anagoge. And I have shown you, I hope, that there is a plausible argument to be made that 4E cognitive science is generating a framework that makes central, not only makes critical, makes credible, but makes gives priority to conformity and anagoge. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure we'll have a uh, a discussion right now, and uh, I'm just tempted to abuse my position as a <laughs> coordinator of this to just to, to launch this discussion. It's um, you, you began your um, lecture by talking about phenomenology, yes. so I'm, I'm just trying to work on another layer of my of my bias here. But this is for me. This is a phenomenology. Which you propose, grounded in 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 cognitive science, and it's 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 really beautiful. But then uh, a question that comes to my mind is, what kind of ontology mm -hmm. is needed for this phenomenology? So I know many phenomenologists would would consider that this a heresy, and by, yes, by ontology, I don't mean. Well, I I think Heidegger was misguided in, in the way he, he depicted the Western metaphysics uh, in many ways. Uh, so ontology became, you know, something just rigid, static, and as, as you know. But, uh, well, this is what I, I, I think people like Plotinus, Augustine, Areopagite, Eugena, all of them would ask what kind of ontology of yeah. reality we need to make it work because you, you show that, it, it, that things work like that. The, the Cartesian model is, it, it just doesn't work really. This works, but why this works? It, I think it has to work because reality is such that it works. So what kind of reality we need for it to work? And the traditional answer, which I, I really believe in is that for instance, being and knowing is, it's not separate. There is, uh, there can be no existing being which is not known, which is immediately for any decent scientist I can imagine. Maybe not for you. This is complete anathema. What do you mean? There are no beings which are not uh, cognized. But, but I, I can't imagine any any other way of thinking about this other than assuming that, as, as Plotinus would put it being and intellect and life this is just those are just aspects of one reality they they have to be uh on some fundamental level which would explain why reality is relational why why all of that is is a, as you described it uh yeah but but this is so much against the sort of popular view of uh of reality right now the naturalistic view uh, so I, I'm obviously I'm curious what you what you think about that, uh, and of course if 
reality is at the same time existing and known and knowledge is not something that popped out after after billions of years into existence and, and will vanish soon. But if knowing, awareness, consciousness is an integral part of reality as such, then Plotinus would say, Pacha Aristotle, that we have to have something even more fundamental, which is neither a being nor a knower, but something deeper out of which this, this unity of being and knowing emerges. So yes, <laughs> so that's uh, and so I decided between this lecture and a lecture that would have addressed that question you just raised. But I realized if I went to that lecture, I I would be presupposing too much, and I'd be true doing all this backfilling, and then my lecture would be three hours long. So I would now, if I had the opportunity, I would now give an argument that I've been building elsewhere, uh, both uh, uh, you know online and in uh, uh, the online courses I've been doing, uh, in, you know making use of Filler's work, but also making use. Of a very converge in a very convergent way with work by Nishida and Nishitani uh, from the Kyoto School uh, Zen, um, and here's what I would say to you: I would say to you that I agree with you. I think that um, knowing and intelligibility, we need an ontology, and this is part of the blind spot, right? And this is uh, this is also part of Fuller's argument: that we need an ontology in which intelligibility is a proper part of uh, of being. Um, and, but we have to do, as you were careful to do at the very end, we don't want to simply logically identify intelligibility and being, because then we will get into all the problems of a sort of homogeneous monism, and we will have, been, we will have, we will have reprioritized subject, predicate, logic, and computation over everything else, and we would have then have gone into just forgetting all of this argument that I've just made. So we need, a, we need this non-logical um, identity between intelligibility and being. Well, what does that mean? Well, I mean, I, I, I think what it means is, and this is not just me, this is people like Yoraro. You need to bring back a non-flat ontology. I'll answer in a, a couple of stages, Matthias. What does that mean is there's not only bottom-up causation that causes things to emerge, like how water emerges out of hydrogen. There has to be top-down constraints that emanate and shape the possibility so that those chemicals will have a particular kind of interaction. In fact, your biology, biology is, is like a, an autopoetic system is described in terms of what's called the closure of constraints. Let, let me try and explain. I hope this lands. You've got a bunch of chemical processes happening in you that makes this structure, but that structure constrains the probability of chemical processes so that chemical processes that are normally very highly unlikely are very probable inside you and processes that are highly likely in the environment are very improbable in you. So the chemical processes produce a structure that alters, that binds the probabilities of the chemical structure, of the chemical processes. And when, when, that, when that binding is lost, when the probability of events inside and outside of you, well, what is that state when the probability of events inside and outside is the same? That's death. That's what death is. It's the opposite of life. So you have bottom-up causation. You have top-down constraint. But even that language can be misleading because it can lead you into sort of a two-world idea. And that's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is it's emanation all the – sorry, it's emergence all the way up, emanation all the way down. And you actually use this language to explain dynamical system. You have the causal events of reproduction and competition going on in evolution – but you have the constraints that are emanating, right? The conditions of possibility given by scarcity and variation. And so you have constraints and causation, bottom up, top down, very analogous. And I would argue more than analogous, but that's a longer argument. Two, emanation and emergence or procession and return. What is return? It's the self-organizing of things into one. What is emanation? It is how the constraints cause differentiation uh, in causal processes, informing them. Uh, and this is an ontology that is gaining ground, and I'm arguing for it in 4E COGSI. I'm the person that's most arguing that 4E COGSI plugs us back into a Neoplatonic ontology. Now, I hesitate around the intelligibility means known. Um, I think it means knowable, which isn't quite the same thing as known. 
um, and because I I worry about uh, the 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 critiques that phenomenology generates into idealism, and I think if phenomenology is going to be distinct from idealism and all of its problems, it has to keep some difference between intelligibility and knowing, because that's what idealism does. And idealism collapses them. And phenomenology is arguing, no, no, there are, we're returning to the things other than us and our knowing of them in some ways. But what I do think is, and this is a much larger argument, so I'm just answering your question. I can't give you the argument. I do think we get a return of the microcosm, macrocosm of relationship that the, the same grammar that's driving the top down, bottom up nature of my cognition, because that's what that's the model for cognition. It's inherently emergent and emanating bottom up, top down. That grammar is saying is the same grammar as the grammar of reality that is bottom up, top down. So they share the same grammar, and that is why reality is inherently intelligible. They Cognition and reality participate in the same grammar, and that is the grounding of the how intelligibility and, and being are bound uh, together. So I would argue for the microcosm, macrocosm. I am arguing in public for a return of the notion of a cosmos rather than a universe, and I think that is the ontology that is implied by this. It is a an ontology that has a vertical dimension, not only a horizontal spatial temporal dimension, but a vertical dimension between levels of reality that can be genuinely realized with a strong form of transcendence in conformity. So you don't so transcendence is not just a psychological phenomena, it's an ontological change because you are moving to a different level of being, a different level of being a self, a different level of being the world, and that ultimately is grounded in intelligibility, which is a shared grammar between cognition and reality. So I think this is at least acceptable uh, to a Neoplatonic framework um, and acceptable to our ontology. And that, of course, is what um, Evan and um, uh, Adam and Marcello are arguing in the blind spot. We need that kind of, they argue against reductionism, against a flat ontology. We need an ontology that has a vertical dimension to it and that has this kind of intelligibility co-baked into cognition and being so that reality realization and relevance realization participate in the same fundamental principles. Mm -hmm. They're arguing for that and they're arguing that that is what we need to be adequate to the phenomenology of our experience, the very phenomenology that is presupposed by science. So I know you don't agree with this, but that is that's well, thank my you, response. Thank you, but that, thank you. That, that, that's clear right now. So before I open the floor for other questions, I, yeah, I, I think the prop that there is a, a line that some people will not cross, namely if uh, it's it's very. Uh, I mean, I appreciate your distinction between knowable and known. Although I think that there can be no knowable without it being known, but of course, traditionally, as you know, the we would have to refer to well, in, within Plotinus, of course, we would have to re uh, refer to to nous, to inter to cosmic intellect, which Plotinus says it's like like a great city with a soul, uh, so a community of of minds knowing beings in the christian tradition we would have to resort to angelic hierarchies so uh, like this community of of knowers which are in relationship with things known uh but this is a line which i mean even approaching today would probably discourage or discourage people who are really want to pursue this because it's, it sounds completely crazy. I mean, you said that some of things you do sound crazy to some people, but <laughs> this is real level crazy, of course, for, for many people. So I'm I'm fascinated and worried about how to how to bring those two together. Because you know, once you posit the existence of angels, I mean, the end of discussion probably for from the majority of of scientists. But yeah, but this but this comes to what you said: the difference 
or the question whether there can be intelligibility without there being intellect. Yeah, and uh, just to, to, to say two things, science is moving towards this, but a little bit more like what I'm saying. Um, so, I mean, you don't necessarily have to have angels. There are other proposals that the forms are ideas in the minds of God or something like that. And, right. Um, uh, and I, I, I don't want to get into, you know, in-house disagreements between Neoplatonists. Um, but why I bring that up is people like Michael Levin, a really cutting edge biologist, is saying, no, there's a platonic space in which there is something like a living system. And he's, he, he does this with living because he doesn't mean biological. And so he, he admits all the language becomes analogical. But what he's saying is there's something like a living system of all the constraints on the possibilities of intelligibility um, and, on, and therefore also on all the possibilities for intellect. So all the ways in which there, there things could be intelligible and there could be intellects, that is already sort of co-shaped in an eternal space mm -hmm. that you need in order to explain the kind of stuff that he's discovering mm -hmm. in his biology. Mm -hmm. And then also you have, within physics, you have the growing movement for the realism of information. Now, it's not semantic information. It's not meaningful information. But it's least information in that, and that seems to be bound to something like intelligibility. See, what you, when you get in a lot of these experiments, like the double split experiment and other things, is they, there doesn't have to be something conscious there to make it a wave or a particle, but there has to be a machine that can detect it so that when a person looks at the machine, they can read the detection and that has determined, which is it's not the same thing as there being a conscious agent. There has to be something like the intelligibility of the information is somehow baked in. Um, and so those are some of the things I would, would, would say. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know you don't totally agree, uh, but what no, I'm saying is well, I'm just pointing that there are scientists that are moving okay. a little bit towards what you're talking about. Yeah. Great, great. Uh, yeah, so I, I saw Kevin, Kevin Corrigan raising his virtual hand. Pardon me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, I can hear you. I'm, I'm slightly east of you in a coffee shop, so I may be... My voice may be occluded by many extraneous noises, and I'm, I'm not sure I can. And I'm, I'm not sure I can hear. Good, good. I really loved your talk. Uh, I can I just inter Can I just interrupt you and say it's a pleasure to meet you? I've read a lot of your work and I've deeply appreciated it, and I've been oh. educated by it. I wanted to thank you for that. Oh my, I I feel humble. I'm not I'm not putting the uh, I'm not putting the video on because I'm not quite in proper mode here. But never mind. Um, I actually love this talk, and I think that you could look at it too as the kind of anagogic identity yeah. of being and knowing in mm -hmm. this particular way. The way that you formulated this from conformity to representation, I'll, I'll leave that question with Heidegger to the side for the moment, and then transjectivity, relevance, adaptivity, which reminds me so much of the so-called stoic notion of oikiosis. Yes. Uh, but is is there also there also in Plato, particularly in the Republic, um, the dynamic systems theory, and uh, then reciprocal opening, and the different kinds of knowing, propositional knowing, to uh, procedural knowing, to participatory knowing, and I love the way that you finished it with imaginal knowing, because in a sense you are rethinking the divided line in a way that I take to be absolutely true to Plato. So when I look at it in this particular way. I, I see it a little bit like Socrates in the symposium. He He's both there and yet he never quite entirely makes it because he's also at the first rung of the ladder as well. Yeah. When I come, just thinking of a work that I read of Mateusz recently, if I look at the great work of Plotinus, 3.8 on nature contemplation of the one, 5.8 on uh, intelligible knowing, and then 5.5, that the intelligibles are not outside intellect, that they're in fact identical with them. We do meet the identity of knowing and being earlier in in uh, in that, that great work that goes up to 2.9 against the Gnostics. But it's only in 5.5 that we finally get the question directly of this identity of the knower and being itself. And for times there uses the word tupoi, which he's, he's going to go on to criticize the Gnostics for. So in a sense, he never forgets that he's in a world in which we haven't yet made it and can say for certain 
that we are now disembodied intellects, where intellects, as it were, on the way projectively towards the disembodied. So I was thinking while you were talking, how does this relate to Neoplatonism and Platonism? But gradually, as you came and you answered Mateusz at the very end there, I came to see actually that Neoplatonism in this particular framework as a framework with a kind of epistemological humility and yet a kind of projective, yet a, proje a projective anchoredness and a sense also that every trajectory is not something pre-established by propositional logic, but has a procedural, imaginal, and noetic projectivity to it, which actually reaches up to the question that we're dealing with an infinite universe in which all of the potential connections in our brain are more than the putative uh, atoms in the universe. We're dealing with something which is not just bland, generic, specific, however important those things are, but which is also which is also the search for the unique in this particular way that I, as I take to be the platonic form itself. So I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of recapitulating what I understood from your, from your really interesting talk, which set off bells in my mind in many different directions. And I, first of all, I just want to, I just want to applaud you for providing this other framework. I think it's terribly important that we bring uh, other disciplines, many disciplines to bear in trying to understand something which is not just of historical interest, but which is still our present task, which is to understand something and to understand it new, to be able to communicate it to others, and yet to bring it within ourselves and make it our own at the same time. So when I, so the question I really have for you, I'm sorry, I'm rabbiting on here, but the question I really have for you is, could this be a kind of uh, as you put it, um, transjective identity, this anagoge is a work in progress, like Plato's seventh letter, that at the end of it, whatever we come up with at the end of it, we still have to submit to well-meaning refutations. And those well-meaning refutations will actually be a different approach to the truth, no matter how much we stay within systems and have to stay within systems in order to be human on our way to whatever truth it is. That, that's my, it's not a very good question, but it's the best I can do. I disagree. I think it's a wonderful question. I first want to uh, reply to some of the, first of all, thank you. I think the articulation you gave was excellent. Um, I also want to uh, reply to something you were saying along the way, because uh, I did mention, I think this restores the plausibility and the promise of Neoplatonism as a way of life. I think when we understand reality as an inexhaustible fount of intelligibility in which and to which we are bound, we get a new way of thinking about sacredness and a new way of enacting a reverence towards that sacredness. And that's a big chunk of another big chunk of the work that I'm doing uh, elsewhere. And I think that that overlaps with the, the kind of intense meaning in life that is encountered in sacred. And Kevin, I'm not giving you an argument. I'm gesturing at arguments that could be made, but I just wanted to first pick up on that. This notion that we are transjective, this is also a big part of my work. I have been arguing um, another one of the assumptions that I didn't challenge from the Cartesian conceptual framework is the monadic monological monophasic self, that what it is to be a self is to be like this inherently completely bound thing, you think of Taylor's buffered self, completely bound thing that reasons monologically within a single state of being conscious, a monophasic state. All of that, to my mind, is false uh, because the cognitive science is showing, no, first of all, you do not reason better monologically. The evidence, the empirical experimental evidence is becoming overwhelming that we reason better dialogically, either literally with other people or, and this is really cool, by imagining dialoguing with other people. So we our reasoning is inherently dialogical. The idea that we are, that the brain needs phases other than sort of everyday consciousness in order to deeply learn, this is actually being driven by the current neuroscience and the current cognitive science and current AI. When, like when you're getting these powerful neural networks to learn, 
they they get into a problem called uh, overfitting to the data. I can't, I don't have time to explain it right now, but what you have to literally do is you have to stop them learning, disconnect them from the world for a sec, dump them full of noise so they get scrambled so that they open up the possibilities of cognition. And it looks like this is what psychedelics and dreaming do and imaginal practices do it. It's plausibly why we mind wander. Like all of this is opening up. So the idea that we are inherently dialogical, that we are inherent, that we exist on a, a, a continuum of cognition and consciousness. I think these are also being radically challenged, like, sorry, these are being radically proposed as a way of challenging uh, the Cartesian framework. And this is another big chunk of my work, Kevin, that I do. And I think it is totally consonant both with the cog sci and with the Neoplatonic proposal. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Thank you, John. It's, it's, you don't know, Kevin, you don't know how much that means, me hearing that coming from you. You, you have been a companion in my mind, in my education into Platonism and Neoplatonism. So thank you very well, much. I'm, I'm deeply honored from Bakhtin to the first words of the symposium. Uh, the answer to a question which has never been posed and which is continually being posed and which is always and always will be posed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any, any other? questions i think david has a question yeah, yeah. um and I, I'm, I'm going to have to i hear my family uh, calling um uh so i i'll have to leave in just a moment it's been a real privilege um to to first of all to listen to you john i i learned so much in such a concentrated period of time um as i always do talking to you but the, this is the first time i've heard you sort of lay out your 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 thinking at least in in one aspect and it's 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 um fast i mean it's brilliant it's fascinating and uh thrilling to know that that um there's this movement and development uh development happening in cognitive science um uh you know we inside the the world of philosophy one thinks that that philosophers are the only ones who sort of care about these things, but you, but it's 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 really something to see how um, uh, philosophy itself can be fructified by these um, these work in other disciplines. So I really appreciate that, and I appreciated um, uh, Mateus and, and Kevin's um, questions and your answers to them. And I, there there's some there are dimensions of those questions I would love to pursue further. And I'm I'm hoping I know that we'll have some occasion in the future at some point to discuss further so i, I hope I've, so i hope i'm so. making a list in in here <laughs> but but one one thing that, that just to pick up on that last point that you were making it's related to something i, I was wondering about um you're talking about this more expansive notion of the self um uh when you when you talked about caring at one point in your presentation um uh you you said, okay, well, where do we see this? We see this in this autopoietic, you know, in self-care, you might say, and in, in, in things wanting to survive. And, um, and I wonder, I wonder if that's the the uh, that certainly is illuminating. But I but I wonder if that for the very reasons that you're giving, uh, whether that would have to be complemented or or corrected. You know, is it is it the case that that um, caring for oneself is um, opens up most directly the model model of caring what what do i what one of the things that's prompting that question is um something that i've uh learned from plato was something in plato that has really uh struck me in fact i was just talking to my wife about it last night um uh, a difference i see between plato and, and aristotle that that um for a, a kind of difference it depends on how you read aristotle but um uh this notion that, that in plato that the 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 first object of our care is the good it's something that transcends us and transcends the self and and transcends the difference between and and that 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 functions that's not something that we just eventually get to i think we we um almost inevitably have this model of starting with the self and expanding out into larger and larger spheres and eventually maybe reaching the good but um one of the things i take to be a, a, an essential neoplatonic insight certainly platonic one is that we actually begin with the highest in some mm. some basic way and that 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 um uh, complicates to the the sense of what um 
the an the you know the, the sort of anagoge uh, dimension yeah. um and you know what would that mean that m m might be that you know we we don't in the first in the first sense care about ourselves but we care about ourselves only because we are the the, the most proximate access we have to the good but what we actually care about in some most in the, the, the most fundamental sense is a good that transcends us anyway i could elaborate that question all sorts of ways but i'll just end there and see what you yeah. think so First of all, the last thing you say, I, uh, the last way you put it, I, I'm pretty much in uh, complete agreement with. I, when I was speaking that way, I was speaking in terms of the, the way people talk about autopoiesis. So I was trying to be true to the, the presentation. And, and I think that argument it, it, it still runs on its own. Now, to yeah. this deeper question, I think I, I, I used to think the way you, you said. I used to think like paramecium are only caring about themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a sense in which maybe but 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 and then you, you have to go up to like mammals that have parental relationships because what you what you clearly see with mammals and, and and with and even more so with primates is that the arrow of relevance turns the other way instead of how are things relevant to me it's how am i relevant to others yeah. right but now i'm increasingly thinking like like you're saying well even the paramecium is is, is caring about the good. It's caring about a very truncated good. It's caring about the good of relevance, right? And it's caring about that. Um, I Maybe where we differ is I think the distinction between relevance to me and relevant and how I'm relevant to, I think the, and the paramecium, they're in, they're, there's no space between them, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think as, um, but I do think this idea that um, we're, that, that, the organisms are always pursuing their good, and in that sense, pursuing a good, uh, and then in that sense, pursuing the good. Um, and I, I know there's platonic argument needed in there, and I'm trying to answer you quickly. But I, I'm increasingly moving towards the position. I don't think it undermines the argument I made, and I don't think you're no, not at all. It. Yeah, no, no. But I do think that you you say. Because if you think that organisms are inherently dialogical, transjective, there is a sense when, in which caring for the other is going to be constitutive to their very being. I agree with that argument. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, Aquinas uh, says that, that um, uh, in fact, all things um, love God more than themselves naturally. Mm. And all things, not just, I mean, that, that, that's really an extraordinary thing and and um uh you know an evidence i mean this it's 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 a fascinating piece of evidence that's i think um um amplifies really that you know confirms your your argument and 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 shows that uh, especially when it connects it to this this point that you were making with with kevin um that you know uh, aquinas asks why is it that the the pleasure of sex is more intense than the pleasure of eating and he says that uh, 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 it's because in, 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 um, th th there's a sort of a deeper level of the self that's involved, and it's the self that is identical yeah. to the species. So there's a certain sense in which the whole is operating in me um, uh, uh, in, in sexual activity in the way that, that eating just concerns this sort of my individuality. You know, sex concerns me precisely as a member of a species. And so, and so it's, it's, it operates more fundamentally in me. I, I, I think that's an extraordinary insight and really- I think that's a great that. argument. I think that's a great argument because it takes into account an evolutionary answer to your question and say, yeah, I agree. It's taking into account the species and it's a good response to Schopenhauer's pessimism that sex is the joke that the species plays on the individual. It yeah. completely inverts things the other way that's around. Right. That's right. I think that was great. Thank you, David. Uh, but like I said, I, I, that's been a recent shift in my thinking. Um, so, yeah, no doubt yeah, because mine, I was mine, mine no doubt because I was te oh, well, no doubt though because I was teaching the primacy of beauty, influenced by this guy <laughs> named DC Schindler. So probably that could be the reason. Well, thanks, John, and and God God bless your work, <laughs> and thank you for it all. And I, I I'm afraid I I need to run here, but um, it was nice seeing you, David. Thank Very you. Nice Goodbye, you. Goodbye, David. Thank you. Thank you for thank you, Matthias, for posting. Me too. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Kevin. Goodbye, Kevin. You. If we Great pleasure meeting you. I hope to meet you in person someday. Best for each is that which most truly belongs to each, Republic 9. And of course, Kellogg's conflicts, I care about them, but I really do care about the other who is the better half of myself, as Augustine well puts it. Take care. Take care.
If we have time for some more time, Jakub Hanschu has a has a question. Um. So. Um, so how much? How much time do you have, John? I could take this last question and okay. then I, I should head out after okay, that. Sure. Uh, well, I will be brief. So at least try. Uh, when you, thank you for your talk, first of all. And I have a question because when you were talking about transjectivity, I was thinking about practice of geometry and mathematics. It's Platonic sense. It's more like lofty, um, aspiring sense towards sacred the, geometry in a sense. Yes, like yes, geometry. exactly. As this, perhaps. This idea appears in Timaeus that the mathematical forms or geometrical forms are present in our souls, individual souls, but they also reflect some macrocosmic order, perhaps. So basically, there is this idea of correspondence yeah. there. Like geometry is basically this in between space between what is, as I understand it, between what is individual and what is perhaps universal. So I was just maybe it's a question. Have you considered it in your work? Yeah, this very much, work? very much. And we are trying to actually, at the Awaken to Meaning, where we try to sort of use Cog Sci and Neoplatonism and Zen to create practices, mindfulness practices and imaginal practices, we have we have a practice that are developing um, called contemplative geometry uh, around just exactly this. Because I think that uh, geometry was imaginal, uh, not imaginary, was imaginal. It was imaginal practice that that bridged between uh, the perspectival and the propositional. Clearly, it bridges, as you say, between the individual and the universal in some fashion. Um, I think it is doing this, I think it is metaxu in the platonic sense, uh, through and through. And I, I think, therefore, that um, uh, we have, because we, we replaced uh, geometrical math with, uh, with uh, um, algebraic math, and then ultimately Cartesian graphing, uh, we we got displaced as to that capacity. Uh, the, the thing that with the uh, with the Cartesian graphing is it's got the imaginal there that we actually need, but it disguises it so we don't give it a central place, and we think the analytic equations are the key thing. Do, do you see what I'm trying to say? But why do we graph? Well, we graph because we need we actually need the imaginal. But we 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 hide it under the Cartesian framework. Oh no! But really matters is I have this equation that uh, describes everything. But if you go back to geometry before you get that sort of suppressing, you recover the imaginal nature of mathematics, and you recover the fact that it can it is metaxu. It helps to align the kinds of knowing. It helps to align the inner and outer. It's doing all the imaginal, the up and down and the in and out that Corbin talks about. And like you said, it's doing the platonic of giving us a way in which we can experience how the particular is participating in the universal. I totally agree. And we are trying to put that literally into practice for people. Mm. Okay, it's amazing. Uh, because recently I picked up the practice of geometry and I tremendously enjoy it. And I can see that in some way, it's like internalizing those platforms in the minds of God, basically. And then yeah. you can pick up on those patterns in reality and you can see them everywhere. So so it's, it's nice cool. to hear that. Thank you. Who's the author yeah. of The Practice of Geometry? It's uh, Robert uh, Robert Edward Grant. Okay, I, thank you. I learned uh, it in his course and he also talks about this Pythagorean dimension. It's basically a geometry is Pythagorean yoga. And also in Rosicrucianism, it's it's very prevalent. It's uh, sacred geometry. I'm going to order that book. I've I've been trying to gather together books around sacred geometry as a practice. There's so oh. much woo out there around sacred geometry, but I'm trying to find. I, you know, you have to you have to swim through all this dreck to get to the mm -hmm. to get to the gold. But that sounds like gold, so I'm going to go and get that. I want to thank you for that recommendation. Oh yes, yes. Oh, and there's also a good book I I recently ordered it. It's it's called Homage to Pythagoras. It's it's a, it's a series of essays by uh, Keith Critchlow, I, th I think. And he was a fellow of, of Temenos Academy in the UK. And they also teach about sacred geometry in the context of Platonic tradition. And it's, it's, really, it's a really a blast to learn. I'll, it, yeah. I'll look at both of those books. I'll probably end up getting both of them. Um, so okay. I wanted to... Oh, yeah. go ahead, Max. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to thank you, but... You, you, wanted to, you wanted to say something? Well, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, um, you continue to put together things that I want to participate in. And um, 
I'm hoping that you will consider me again in the future when you put together something else because you put together great stuff. I know we're, at some point in the future we're going to be talking together. We're going to be uh, recording a discussion about your book that you sent me, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, John, for, for your excellent lecture and discussion, for your generosity. And yeah, I, I don't want to keep you any longer because you have to you have to go so so thank you really and i also thank the audience for for being here and yeah we, we resume in september lecture about owen barfield i will be sending sending information about that <laughs>